Hi, and welcome to Chapter 12. This is where we take a look at patients' personal and physical needs. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to take a look at some of the devices for psychological needs, like water, um, elimination of urine, um, so the Foley catheters. We're going to also talk about a little bit about um, some of the colostomy bags that you could see in a patient. And then we'll end the chapter where we're talking about elder abuse and child abuse and what type of symptoms that you'll look for in those situations. So in this chapter, we need to be very concerned about our patients. Anxiety is common. It's common in society today. Um, it's very common with your patients. They have a fear of a possible diagnosis. So a lot of them will come in and they've been avoiding for years getting a diagnosis because they're afraid that it may be cancer. And so then instead of coming and getting treatment right away, they avoid going to the doctor because they'd rather not know that it's cancer than to deal with the fact that they have cancer and could possibly die. There's effect of illness on your family. Um, there's also uh, concerns over modesty. So some of them, especially your transgender patients, are very reluctant to come in and receive care because they feel like they're being judged by medical professionals. And a lot of them don't know how to treat those patients or how to communicate with those patients. So one of the things we have to be concerned about as a radiographer is reassurance of providing professionalism we want to have a professional touch, attitude, details of our procedure when dealing with these patients. So when we're talking about psychological needs, um, there's water. So um, one of the things that we have to be concerned about with our patient that comes into the room is, are they NPO? So if they're nothing um, by mouth, this means no food or liquid. They can't have ice chips or small sips of water. And a lot of times your, your patient will be asking for water, but if they're NPO, you have to explain to them that they can't have the water. If you don't know and you're up on the floor, then one of the things you can do is check with the nurse and see, is this something that the patient could have? Because sometimes they will allow them to have ice chips, um, and in some situations they won't. And so if you're never certain, contact the nurse and they will be able to, to help you out in that situation on what you should be doing. When we talk about elimination, we are talking about um, that urgent need to void. So they may have a full bladder that's causing them to be uncomfortable, and then they're moving on the table on you because they have to go to the bathroom. So a patient's immediate and pressing needs must take um, top priority over the procedure. So if they need to go to the bathroom, then you need to get them off the table, let them go relieve themselves, and then you can bring them back into the room so that they can finish what they started. So again, water, check your chart, make sure that they're allowed to have those fluids. A lot of times it's easier with a straw for them to drink the fluids. And then you do need to report back to the nurse that they did have water and here's how much uh, when you're bringing the patient back to the room. A lot of times they're tracking how much they're drinking and they're voiding. Um, so if they have an elimination, they're an inpatient, you do need to use um, a urinal or a bedpan so that you can get a measurement again uh, for them and how much output was provided and report that back to the nurse. If they have a Foley catheter, sometimes they'll send them down and then the bag is full. Again, you're gonna need to empty that. So make sure that you have gloves and that you're measuring out and recording how many cc's you emptied so that you can report that back. You're going to check your chart for any special instructions, so if there's a specific collection container. Um, and again, if you need to record input-output, then you have to report that back to the nurse. So elimination continued. We're talking about some of your patients may have urinary catheters in place. So those bags, um, when you come into the room, you need to make sure that you know where that catheter is on your stretcher or on the wheelchair because you need to be aware for transferring the patient to make sure that it doesn't get caught in the wheels or caught on the stretcher and pulls out. So that collection bag needs to be kept below the bladder to prevent any backflow and contamination. You don't want to cause an infection in their bladder. Colostomy and ileostomy bags as well. Um, there may be times where you have to empty out that colostomy bag and you just need to report again back to the nurse that this that it was full and that you needed to remove it. If you're doing um, a barium enema, you may be removing that so that you can insert the tube through 
through there and do your procedure. So there's times where we'll come into contact with those types of devices for our exams. Any sanitary napkins may also be needed, so just know where those are kept if your patient asks for them. They'll usually be by the locker rooms, and then you can hand those off to your patient so that they, um, they aren't searching for that need. This is an example of what your urinal is going to look like. Um, so these, for a male, um, the male urinal is made out of plastic. Um, they don't typically make them out of metal anymore because we do dispose of them after use. Your patient can be supine, laying on the right or left side in a Fowler's position, and they can use this device. Most of them, if you hand it to them, they're able to relieve themselves on their own. Um, and in some situations, you may have to help adjust this device for them to use. You are going to confirm your urinary output, so the volume that's in here. You'll see the measurements right here alongside uh, the device. You're going to track that. Again, report that back to the nurse. And then just make sure that you empty it and wash your hands um, before taking care of your patient. If you have a female patient, then, or if your patients need to relieve themselves by defecation or stools, you are going to have a plastic bedpan that you're going to place underneath your patient. So make sure that you wash your hands, you assist them with the bedpan, give them some privacy so that they can relieve themselves, and then you'll come back in and, and take care of emptying that out. So this is what one of those looks like underneath your patient. So that fractured bedpan has a unique wedge-shaped design that slides right underneath your patient for correct placement and removal. If you don't put this in correctly, then they will end up voiding on your x-ray table. So make sure that you do slide it with the skinnier end underneath the patient's buttocks, and then the thicker end comes out. When it comes to patient safety, we do have certain positions that may be more comfortable. So if they're on the table and they have a lot of back pain, maybe by bending their knees will give them more support so that they aren't um, uncomfortable. So give them support, give them padding. Um, sometimes we don't like to have pads on our x-ray table because they can interfere with the positions that we're trying to obtain. But simply by placing a sponge underneath their knees, may help rest that back so that they're not in so much pain. You can also grab blankets for your patients. So if they're cold, those rooms tend to be very cold. Grab some blankets and put them on your patient. Remember that supine, prone, and lateral positions typically can be very um, challenging for some patients. So if your patient's laying supine and they're complaining of their back, bend their knees, put the, the sponge underneath their knees. Um, prone positions can be very challenging. You don't want to leave them in that position for very long. So get your radiographs done in that prone position and then rotate them back over. And sometimes the most comfortable is going to be for them laying on their side or a SIMS position. Um, the thing with our x-ray tables is we can't bring the head of the table up into a Fowler's position, so that would be something that you may need to do on a stretcher. So get your exam done, put them back on the stretcher, raise their head so that they are able to breathe easier. So sometimes semi-Fowler positions work well. Um, Trendelenburg positions, we're only going to see those in fluoroscopy where we're raising their feet above their head. When you do this position on a fluoroscopy table, I do suggest that you put a restraining belt across them or put the hand grips on the table so that they have something to help hold them in place because, again, with their anxiety levels, they're going to be a little concerned that they're going to come off the table. These other two positions are more something you would do in um, when up in the nursing station so that they're they're putting in an enema. Um, if we're doing a help, hysterosalpenogram, we may do something with the lithotomy position, but those are typically positions that we place our patients into. So here, again, is that sponge that you can place underneath your patient to make them a little more comfortable. And so um, offer. If they're complaining about their back, just say, you know, would you like to have a sponge underneath your knees? Or request that they bend their knees up to help make them more comfortable on the table. In this situation, you can see she's pretty exposed. That's where those blankets come into play, which are pretty nice to put over them. So a lot of departments have extra blankets and sheets that you can cover your patient up with. 
we're going to be using restraints or immobilization devices, uh, remember that you do require a physician's order. Um, they should only be used to ensure patient safety. We can use tape and positioning sponges, sandbags to help immobilize, but make sure that you're communicating with your patients so that they know, here's why I'm immobilizing you so that you don't move. Then they're aware of what's going on. They know it's just temporary and then you're going to get them out of that position soon. So communicate well with your patient. So that's pretty critical during any exam. Try to use the shortest possible time, so exposure time. Immobilize aids when possible, so those positioning sponges, tape. Um, empathy with your patient can be very effective. So just, you don't have to sympathize with them, but you should empathize with what they're going through. So some examples of those immobilized navy devices are your positioning sponge, sheets, sandbags, Velcro straps, head clamps, and any other devices that you would find in your room. We can do cervical collars. They'll come in on a backboard with the cervical collar. Make sure you leave those on your patient unless you're instructed by the physician that you can remove it. So a spine board, again, you got to leave them on that board unless you've been instructed to remove it. Same with splints. Um, we can do some sheet restraints that we'll talk about with um, especially infants or pediatric patients. So we do have some commercial restraint devices such as our Pigastats that we can use on our patients as well. And we can use stockinettes to help immobilize pediatric patients especially. And tape will become your best friend when you're out there. So your positioning sponges. It's just a method of reducing patient movement. So it allows them to have some place to rest again. Uh, they are free of any artifacts on your film, so they do a nice job of demonstrating what you need to see without being in the way. Sandbags, here's some examples of sandbags being used to help remind your patient not to move. Here's some examples of tape. You notice how they have the gauze underneath here so that it's not tearing their skin. Stockinettes, here's her arms up above her head and you've used that stretchable cotton fabric to pull over like a sleeve and then it restrains your, your child um, with their arms or their legs. So typically it's upper arms that will do that by placing it above the child's head. Most of your kids are not going to look this, this excited about having to be restrained. So it's kind of a... <laughs> A funny picture to me that they're showing this child who's happy to be restrained because that's not typically the case. So pediatric immobilizations we're going to typically use the stockinettes and the pegastats and those types of devices. But again with children you want to communicate effectively. You got to have lots of patience and try to understand and try to communicate on their level. So any threats or force should be avoided. It's just going to scare the patient and they're not going to cooperate. Parents do come into the room. You want to explain to the parents what you're doing because some of those devices can look pretty scary and they don't understand why you're putting your child into that immobilization device. So here is an infant sheet restraint. Any of you that have had infants and you've done swaddling techniques with them, that's all this is, is you're swaddling your patient so that those arms are um, tied to their sides so they're not moving on the x-ray table. We also have a device called a Pigastat that we use with our infant patients that we place them in to help immobilize them for chest and abdomen work. And we do have restraint boards that are uh, kind of contoured, they're molded with a sponge, they attach with Velcro that we can secure our patients in. So here's an example of that Pigastat with their arms raised above their head. We can do a nice chest x-ray and we can get them in a PA and lateral position this way. I do have a video for you to watch in regards to Pigastats and how they're used, so I would take a look at that video. And here's a device that is called an Octostop Restraint Board. These are wonderful for especially fluoroscopy exams. You can rotate your patient 360 degrees, and you place them in eight different positions. It's radiolucent. and it usually can be used with a patient up to one years old, depending on the size of your patient. Spinal trauma, we do have cervical collars that the patients will come in on that spinal backboard. And in these situations, you're going to do a lateral C-spine first, and then you can get clearance to take the cervical collar off. If they suspect that there's a fracture, they are not going to allow you to remove that cervical collar, and they'll tell you to proceed with them kept on the backboard with that collar on. So here's what those collars look like. And you can see they're Velcroed and they're meant to help hold that spine in place, so your cervical spine, so that the patient doesn't move.
and those can be x-rayed through. So they're radiolucent and we can do our x-rays through the collars. Some of the things that I want you to be aware of when your patients come into the rooms, there are some um, child abuse that can occur. So it's also termed battered child syndrome or a non-accidental trauma. We do have a special routine that you will do for child abuse. So if it's suspected child abuse, you will pretty much x-ray from head to toe for radiographs so that they can look for old fractures as well as current fractures. There are also situations of elder abuse, and with elder abuse, it's one of those things that are really coming to the forefront where you're seeing a lot of um, patients who are being starved, they're not having adequate meals, they're being hit by their caretakers, they're having money stolen from their caretakers. So there are a lot of signs to look for when you're dealing with patients and that you may suspect that this is occurring. So I do have a video that I want you to take a look at about some child abuse signs and what to look for. Basically, you're looking for multiple injuries, um, bruise marks, they may have cigarette burns, black eyes, human bites, um, there may be some skull sutures that are um, separated. They may have circular marks on their wrist or ankles. But the video that I've posted for you, he kind of walks you through and tells you what to look for. And he has some nice uh, x-rays that he's actually showing you and pointing out what those fractures are and what they should look like. As far as elder abuse, it's mostly going to be bruises, pressure marks, any broken bones, um, they may have some abrasions, um, hair may be matted, uh, unexplained withdrawal from normal activities. You'll also tend to notice that the person or caretaker will speak for that individual. So they'll cut them off and they'll be doing the speaking for them. Um, any sudden signs in financial situations is a good sign that something's taking place. You know, their money has disappeared from their bank accounts. They tend to come in with these um, decubitus ulcers, and some of them can are pretty deep. So kind of keep that in mind when you're bringing them onto the x-ray table. It may be very, very uncomfortable for them to hold certain positions because of these ulcers. And so then in these situations, you do want to use a sponge or roll up a sheet to kind of take the pressure off of where that ulcer is. A lot of them, um, they will come in with unexplained weight loss, so they'll be very thin and very fragile. Um, behaviors such as belittling threats could be used by those caretakers and you may notice a strange relationship to, so they're very tense with a person um, or they're arguing with their caretaker. And those are also signs of elder abuse. Geriatric patients are, are the primary patients that you're going to be x-raying. They have a great fear of falling, so they're tending to grab onto the x-ray table. They'll tend to grab onto you. So one of the reasons we want the hair pulled back because they will grab for your hair and they will pull on it. So make sure that you are making that person feel very safe and secure. Keep them warm because they have poor circulation. They are going to be very cold. Um, and works very quickly and smoothly with the patient. Um, they may be disoriented because some of them have dementia. They may have Alzheimer. It's, and so you want to really try to take your time and be patient with them and just reassure them that it's going to be okay. We're almost done when you're doing your positioning. Some things that we have to be worried about is that increased fall or risks. They may say that they're okay to stand, but then they get off the table and they fall. So you always have to be concerned when moving them that do they know how much they actually can put for weight bearing on that leg. They may not. They'll tell you, yes, I can stand, and you'll find out, no, they can't stand. So just kind of take that into consideration when you're moving them. They don't have much fat on them, so when they're laying on the table, it probably is really uncomfortable for them. Their skin is very fragile and will tear very easily, so keep that in mind too, that those sharp nails or long nails, you're going to catch their skin and you're going to tear it, or you could tear it on the table or with the wheelchair when you're transporting and moving them. So motion is really going to be your um, your enemy when you're doing these radiographs. So you want to try to minimize that motion, try to keep those short exposure times. And if you can communicate with your patient, it's really going to be much more effective than if you're immobilizing those patients. Sometimes you can't get away with it. You're going to have to use a mobilization in addition to the communication. But if you really talk to your patient and have patients, that will really um, help you out in the long run. 
With pediatric patients, again, you got to get really creative. Uh, you're going to have to deal with parents that come in. So follow your department policy. It's much easier if you can get them out of the room in some situations. Um, but some parents will be very insistent that they want to come into the room. So just make sure you give them the appropriate lead apron to wear. And again, explain what you're doing when you're doing those radiographs. So hopefully you have a great week. This was the last chapter for this week. And um, so you have those three videos to watch. And then um, you just have some assignments to complete over those chapters after you view this. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.